Hello, and my name is Nahi Gordon. And I'm Yaakov Langer. And you're watching the Meaningful People podcast, but you already know what you're watching. Or listening. Or listening. Yeah, that's true. Because you clicked on it. Yeah. And in this week's episode, episode 26, 26. is Rabbi David M. Cohn. And you probably heard of Rabbi David Cohn in the past. There's, there, you mentioned in the episode, there's, very, there's a bunch of them. And this one in particular is very unique, very interesting. Yeah, he has a really interesting life story. He does. Something that we get really deep into. Um, just yeah. hearing another person's journey is so interesting. You know, I think this episode tackles a bunch. Well, obviously, it's it's a very in, he has a very interesting story about how he met his wife. Mm-hmm. And he also... Um, Got married later on in his life. He getting was into, yeah, getting into Rabbanus. Yeah, and uh, having a, a son with with uh, special needs. We don't want to spoil too much, but this is a doozy of an episode. Don't ever use that word again. What doozy? Why? No. It reminds me of it's a doozy. Remember those I says? All right, we're gonna post a poll on like Instagram if <laughs> if Yaakov should ever use that word again. Why don't or, you like the word? Or we should like give you a jail sentence for even using that word. What's wrong? Is it like not PC? Let's just we'll just let the people we'll let the okay. people answer because okay. that was the, just... the meaningful people will answer. Yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay guys. guys. Hope you enjoy the rest of this episode, and we will see you soon. Welcome to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast where we talk to people who are meaningful. Yeah, that sounds good. Sitting here with Rabbi David M. Cohn. Not to be confused with Reb David Cohn from Flatbush. Not to be confused with Reb David Cohn from uh, Ertz Chevron. Chevron. And not to be confused with Reb David Cohn from Chicago. Right. My uncle. Really? Yeah. Not to be confused, though, although Yaakov is just trying to confuse everybody right now. <laughs> Thanks, Yaakov, because now right. I'm confused. You're Rabbi David M. Cohn. Yeah. Originally yeah. from where? I grew up in West Hempstead, New York, just about a 15, 20 minute drive from here. Really? Yeah. And and I, I, I spoke to you a little prior. You, you were mentioning how you had a more of a modern Orthodox uh, background, upbringing. Yeah, I would say that. Is that what the M stands for in David M. Cohn? Modern? <laughs> <laughs> It stands for for Michael in English and, and Moshe in Hebrew. But that, yeah, I guess that's a suggestion as well. I uh, grew up in West Hempstead, uh, went to Hafter down the, uh, down the wow. street here. Five towns born and bred. Almost, wow. kind of. Yeah, so this was beautiful. Uh, we moved back here a little over three years ago. And it was a certain, a certain uh, type of homecoming for us. Yeah, I felt very at home, very at home, very comfortable here. So but I, I also, I saw that you gave a share in the mirror and you kind of, you know, delved from the modern Orthodox world into more of the like the yeshiva world. I don't know what the <clears throat> non modern Orthodox. What's, what's excuse our labels? You know, I know, just, yeah, it, it is no, what it is. There's no People, right or wrong, but like the fusing, like how what was that like going from one world to another? I think for many years, high school, uh, post high school, I spent uh, two years in Shalavim, kind of religious Zionist institution, then I went to Yeshiva University. But all throughout my becoming more indoctrinated and exposed to the world of Torah. So I always felt I was missing something. I always felt there was this kind of like, there's something else out there, you want to call it Lakewood, Mir, Yeshivish, something that I wasn't per se. I wasn't. I hadn't been exposed to it. It's right. not the way I grew up. But it was something that I felt was important to make me a little bit more well-rounded as a Ben Torah. And uh, at a certain juncture in my life, after finishing Smicha at YU, after finishing law school and practicing law for a number of years, I actually I met my wife, which I'm sure we'll talk about. I decided, you know what, I'm going to go learn in Eretz Yisrael for a number of years, begin the foundation of married life like that. And I thought that that's the time really to go learn in a place that had a different uh, exposure or a different nitiya on some level to what I'd been exposed to previously. And I was fortunate through an array of events to learn by a great Rosh Shiva, Rabbi Yaakov Friedman, who started as a Chabur in the Mir Yeshiva and began his own yeshiva called Birkas Mordechai, and I became very close with him, and that was kind of my exposure to the Olam HaYeshivos, and it's something that I've maintained, you know, uh, you know, since then as well. So, something you mentioned before, and it's, I know it's in your book, for those watching could see me pointing, I read your book, you dropped it off by us, thank you so much. Yeah, living with patience. It's a great book, thank you for reading it. <laughs> so, you, you, mentioned, it. You, you do mention in your book, um, really interesting, you, 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 you're going down that law path, 
thought you were going to be a lawyer, like many of our guests. Yeah. Well, many of our th- pe- guests planned on going, but you either, actually... Either a lawyer or like an outfielder for right. Dodgers. <laughs> but you actually went to law school and you did it. And then, but you're, you're not a practicing lawyer today, right? By the way, I, I laugh because I am a big fan of this podcast and I, I listen to many, many of the episodes. Oh, thank you. And I'm friendly of many, with many of your guests. And I noticed that many of them contemplated law school and right. I didn't do it. And like, what's, what's with me that I actually did it? <laughs> and then I still left it. Interesting. So no, I don't practice law. I haven't practiced law since 2004. Wow. Uh, I, yeah, it's been, it's, I, I was part of the Basin of America for a while and I did some legal work in that framework, but no, I kind of, I left it pretty quickly. I practiced for four years in major firms in Manhattan, uh, Simpson, Thatcher and Bartlett, Freed Frank. These are, are pretty well-known places. It didn't resonate with me. It didn't speak to me. I was single at the time. I was kind of, was kind of biding my time to kind of uh, find my opportunity to transition into claw work, which was something that was really my passion and what I really felt I wanted to do. So no, I don't practice law anymore at all. So, but like, I'm just so curious, what's that like to invest so much time into like... Yeah, four years of schooling for law school. I, I can't imagine three. three, four, whatever it is. It depends if you did the night thing. How many years are you doing, Yako? Huh? <laughs> I'm doing uh, seven years in law school. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, you do it. You do all the work. You actually become a lawyer and then you're like, I don't know, this isn't for me. Like what makes you actually make that shift? No, it's, a great, it's a great question. I think when I was in my 20s, I just wasn't so thoughtful in terms of where life was taking me, how to get from point A to point B. I was kind of open to trying different things. I wasn't really settled yet. My parents, who I'm very fond of and always encourage me and support me, felt they understood I wanted to go into Rabanus, into claw work, but they felt, you know what, it would be a good safety net to have some sort of, uh, something to fall back on, quote unquote. And they were very supportive of it financially and, and, and otherwise. So, you know, and, and, and the truth is that although, you know, from one perspective, it's kind of like, wow, you put in all this time and energy and like, what do you have to show for it on some level? But in truth, the skills that I, that I gleaned in terms of critical thinking, in terms of writing in particular, which is something that, that I enjoy doing very much, writing is not, is not an easy thing to do by any stretch. Uh, I find it challenging, but I find it very rewarding to kind of concretize thoughts and put it down and and put it in you know, Baltania writes about this a lot in terms of like you know taking things from from the higher spheres and kind of bringing them down into our bringing them down to our reality so that's a skill that that I definitely so what I'm trying to say is that a lot of the skills that I gleaned from those years I still very much use so today it wasn't, it wasn't a waste of it wasn't a waste of years in your life you think as a as a rov um it it helps you out. I think. I think there's another advantage to it, particularly when I was at Rub in Manhattan. Yeah. Probably Respect. now as well. <laughs> you know, I think there's a certain credibility that you have when Street you get up from the pulp. Yeah, when you get up from the pulp and you're talking to people about how they should live their lives, or you're trying to encourage them to find more time for Talmud Torah or more time for Chesed. And it's kind of who's this clown? You know, he's sat in yeshiva his whole life. He hasn't. He has no idea what it's really like to mm-hmm. have to quote unquote earn a living and be out there in Wall Street or whatever it is. I think just that backdrop does give you a certain street cred. And gives people a bit of pause. Wait a second, he does know what he's talking about. He has been there, and I often will bring incidences or experiences that I had, you know, back in the day to show them. The world's changed a lot, you know, since right. then. But but still, you know, to the degree that you can show uh, relevance is important. Are there are there ever times where you wake up in the morning and you kind of wish you didn't leave law? That's that's a fascinating question in the sense that there are definitely times. There have been times. Not, not right now, but there have been times over the last, let's say it's 15, 16, 17 years since I came back from Eric Disrell, left Kolel, began working and being part of Claw Life. There definitely have been times when I've thought to myself, uh, I wish I had taken a different pathway, not law, but law opens up other doors and right. there definitely business opportunities, different things that there are definitely times when I've thought to myself that maybe I could be more effective some of the people I look up to and I feel like are the greatest mashpim in Klai Yisrael are not full-time clay Kodesh. I mean, look at yourselves, look at other people. I mean, they're people that I look at that I just admire that they, they, they work, they, they, make, they make a living, they're able to be mashpim in so many ways. And they're also Marbitz Torah. And I, I think it's, an ama- it's not for everybody either, but it's an amazing, amazing model. And it's something that I've, I've reflected on and maybe even have brought in myself in recent years, getting involved in different things, uh, a little bit getting a taste of that type of thing. Yeah. I, I want to get into your, your experiences with, you know, your cloud work in Manhattan. But before uh, I want to discuss, um, you, you were single for a 
oh, quite a few years. What, what age did you get married? I was 31 when I got married. You're 31 when you got married and you have a, a well, first of all, what, what was that like? That Before we get into your crazy, how you met your wife, um, what was that like being, you know, dating and that entire Were experience. you like dating since you were like 23, 24? I or? started dating when I was 21. Oh my gosh. I was very wow. serious about getting married. It was a very painful decade. It was a very difficult sugya. I was somebody who was, I wasn't like one of these guys who like really didn't want to get married. I actually really wanted, I really did want to get married. 21 is young. Yeah, and, 21 is uh, young to start. I had a few serious relationships, you know, at different points uh, where maybe it looked like maybe I was going to get married, but things didn't uh, work out uh, at those times. And uh, it was it was a trying time to to particularly to be it's a lonely time you know as you like at different stages different phases of it you right know? but certainly when your close chaverim our roommates are are getting married and you're being mishtatif and they're simple you're very happy for them of course but you're kind of you know you know an matai higia when is it going to be you know kind of right. when is my time going to come so those definitely were were challenging uh, challenging experiences and challenging years 100% but well, what what did you do to like get by it I'm sure there's a lot of listeners now who are single and are looking for their zivig and they're having a tough time is is there any advice you could give to them based on what you did and I, you know it's interesting I work Hakadosh Baruch puts you through things on some level so that hopefully you can help others and I do work with a lot of singles and try to be mechazik them in, in different ways. I don't think there's one like eight set that fits all. I don't think there's one solution for everybody. Tefillah was very big. You know, was, I davened a lot. I really davened a lot. I, I said special to him every day. I was always talking to the Rebbe Shalom. But it was, uh, I, I can't, it was hard. You know, there were times I took significant breaks from it. It was just, it became overwhelming at mm -hmm. times. Like people, Baruch Hashem, always making suggestions. And, and I, look, everybody has different scenarios. Everybody's Nisayon in the Nisayon is different. Right. You know, for some people, it's not getting suggestions. For other people, it's yeah. It could be it could be a multitude of, of, of things. So it's hard to you know. It really, you need a unique fact pattern to, to give Eitz. But but big like big adol, it's definitely a time to to refine and work on oneself. At the end of the day, you know, you're gonna be you know. I, I always felt I'd get married. I wasn't worried I wouldn't get married. But it was a question of timing. And it's definitely a, a period for inflection and, and introspection and refining oneself so that you'll be the best possible husband or wife you can be in the, in the right time. That's so interesting, though. Like, how come, uh, why did you feel that you were going to get married? You know, I'm sure many people have that fear that, or I'm not sure, I, I can imagine some people have a fear that maybe they're never going to get married. You know, once, you know, they're getting past certain ages and they're seeing all their friends getting married. What was it that, like, solidified in you that I'm going to get married. It's just a matter of time. I don't know exactly. <laughs> I don't know exactly, but I can tell you that I never doubted it. I, I had like a, that was like an analogy I had in my head. Uh, it just popped into my head now as we're talking. I don't even know if it's logical, but I'll, I'll share it. You know, I'm, I'm a relatively open person. That goes on to logical. He'll, he'll understand <laughs> it. No, I, I think I, I used to remember waking up in the morning at times during those difficult years and saying to myself, like, I know there's certain things I just know as a reality. Like, and I, for some reason, I just, I knew I had this crazy thing. Like, you know, like Yom Hamisa is a reality. Mm. Like we live in this world for a finite period of time and then we move on to the next world. Like it's, it's a reality. Like there's a joke about death and taxes and you know, there's certain things that, right. you know, so I don't know. So I was just like, I believe that was like a reality. I, I believed I know there are people that don't get married. Like it's a reality. I know a lot of people like that. I've had in every show I've been the rub of people that never got married. I have relatives of mine who never got married. Not yet. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's I had a <laughs> there was someone I was very close with. Uh, his name was Dr. Lenny Top, Dr. Leibish Top, Zechar Tzadik Levracha, my good friend Kalman Top's father. He was a psychologist, and he used to say there was a certain certain time in people's lives where you go from you know, why isn't he married yet to why did he never get married? There is a time where, yeah, anyone right. can get married, of course, but there is, I think there are, the odds go down at a certain, uh, a, cer a certain time. But in response to your question, yeah, I just, I just, I don't know. It was, just, it was clear to me. It was clear that it was going to happen. I don't, and it wasn't, it's not the shot I was making myself believe that, mm. you know, you can make yourself see things a certain way right. to help bring it about. It wasn't that. I had it. I just, I was like margish. a Munapshuta, like you knew it. I was Margish. Also, I, also, it made sense to me. There was no reason. There are people that, for various reasons, maybe are better off not getting married. There is such a reality. Mm -hmm. I felt I had everything to give in a relationship. It was really just a question of finding the right, right match for myself. And therefore, I felt, I felt like. Yeah, the Kadosh Baruch is gonna. It's gonna happen. It's just so, a question of when. You're 31 years old. You're 31 years old. You're in Israel. 
You're in Israel 31? No, no, he, no, he, no, he no, visits actually, Israel. Yeah. Could you take us oh, down yes, that, sure. that so I wild this, story? I had a son, Haga, that basically uh, I try to go. So from ages 27 to 31, after I had finished Smicha and finished law school, I was an assistant rabbi in New Jersey for five years, which was a great experience as well. And it kind of really whetted my appetite to go into Rabbanus and Klawik, Rabbi Yudin in Fairlawn was a very close mentor and had a, a tremendous hashpa on me in terms of what a Rav can do. So that was always in that was always kind of in the back of my mind. That's where I was going when I got married. But from 27 to 31, that was the years when I was still single and I, it was it was this wasn't appropriate to be like a rabbi as a single guy at that juncture. Mm -hmm. So I went to work in a law firm. But every year in the law firm, I'd go take off Yom Naram and go back to Shalavim, which was my yeshiva where I had learned post high school. I had a very close friend, my college roommate, who was a Rebbe there, Rebelli Reich, and there were people that I, Rabbi Waxman, who was a big Ashba on me, was a Mashkiach there. So I, I'd go back and spend time with them, and it was, uh, it was uh, very Gishmak. It was, it was great, and. Uh, the year that I, the year that I met my wife, so that was a very hard Yom Naram. I think I was already thirty, turning thirty-one. That's like kind of a psychological pivot, right? <laughs> and uh, I sat in shul on Rosh Hashanah in Shalavim, and it was it was very hard to daven that year. Which, by the way, it's also a big so I think, although I davened a lot, I think it's important to acknowledge that there are times when it's hard to daven, and you have to be honest. You know, a real relationship with Debishter is to be able to say, "I don't want to talk to you right now. Mm -hmm. I'm not." You know, you can't force it. And uh, that Rosh Hashanah, I remember sitting there, I took a, I had a book, uh, Sherry Mandel, I think that was her name. She suffered a terrible tragedy. Uh, I think her son was murdered in Tekoa and she wrote a book about the experience. I don't remember the name of the book right now, but I was reading her book uh, and dealing, dealing with her pain. And again, every experience is different, but you can connect with pain on so many different levels. And a lot of that Rosh Hashanah, I just kind of was like reading that book I don't know, chizik, but just kind of wallowing in the pain a little bit. And then the very next day it was Tzom Gedalia. And I went to the Kotel to, to Davin. And I Davin for Shidduch pretty intensely that day. And then uh, I went to the, you know, when, when, the, when the cars come down, you know, on the road there. And, yeah. You know, you're waiting for a taxi and you're waiting. And I got into this taxi. And uh, I walk in and the taxi driver says to me, Why do you look so unhappy? So I'm like, I start explaining to him, you know, I'm a little bit older. I'm not, uh, I'm not married yet. He's like, Bo achshav la amuka. He says, come with me now to Amuka. Let me set the scene. It's like six o'clock <laughs> in the afternoon on some good I haven't eaten all day. Right. It's after two days of Rosh Hashanah, flying into the country. I'm exhausted. I'm kind of like, I'm emotionally spent. And this, this guy is telling me, let's go to Amuka. Like, you know, what does he want? Like, you know, $10 million to drive me to a like, what's, what's this? What's I'll the, give you a good rate. I'll give you a good deal? rate. Yeah. You know? What's the deal? Flicked on the meter. The <laughs> but he, he kept at it. He kept at it. He's like, Akshav, Spantani. Like, he's like, don't think so much. You're thinking too much. Let's do it. Uh, trust me. I'm assuming Spantani means spontaneous. Yeah, yeah. I think okay. so too. <laughs> I, 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 I think it. so too. So, you know what? I said to myself, I made a quick chesed, I said to myself, you know what? I've been dating for 10 years. I've got brachos from like, Many, many Gedola Yisrael. I've tried everything. The one thing, famously, that everybody does is they go to the to Amuka, the, they yeah. go to Amuka, right? They go to the Kevin Tana Yonatan Ben Ozil. Everybody goes. I never went. Never went. It was a schlep. It didn't work. These guys offering me right now. It's a new year, Mamish. Let's go. I'm like you know what? 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 I don't have plans tonight. Where am I going? What do I have to do? I'm right. a single guy. I'm in your shlime for a week. I'm like you know what? Let's get something. To, like I said, let's pick up some food. So we we did it. We stopped by my hotel. We we and we started doing it. We started to, you know, now we're, ha we're sitting like this, like a three hour drive, you the know, there's just running Let's start, uh, <laughs> 300 shekel, 400 so it, shekel. It wasn't a meter. He gave me a, he gave me a set price, which was, which was reasonable, but we were really in Makasha on the ride. Like he started telling me, I understand you. I got married when I was 34. He, he's not, he wasn't that observant uh, at present. Right. Mishpacha magazine just did a whole feature of a circus on mm -hmm. people with their taxi stories. Is I he in it? I didn't get, I didn't get mine in. I feel uh, badly because I wanted to give him the, uh, the, you know, the next him, edition, give, next him, the, give him the props. But it was, uh, we, we really bonded. He starts coaching me. He's like, when we get to Amuka, he tells me, he's like, you have to be macabre on yourself things. You have to accept upon yourself things. You have to, you have to, you know, a bit sniut. You have to do things. You have to give tzedakah. He's giving me like all this advice and all this guidance. And he tells me, whatever you're macabre on yourself at Amuka, don't tell anybody. Like, keep it, keep it mamash to yourself. So we get there like 11 o'clock at night. It's pitch black. Uh, we drive down, you know, all the windy roads there. And there's literally nobody there. It's like, it's desolate. There's like five yeshiva guys at Amuka. 
They happened to be Mir Yeshiva Bacharim. It was, uh, I guess, the Zman was over. Kimat, they were going back to America and they wanted right. to go to Amukah. They were going to start the Parsha Shiduchim, etc. I'm a Kohen. I couldn't even go in. Right. So he went, in for, he went in for me. Oh, wow. He was my shliach. He took stuck in for me. That's he gave crazy. him my name. I stood on the outside and I started to daven, mamish like never before. It, I'll, you know, there's a tension, you know, a, a human, you know, you want Hatzlacha for other people. Chazal teach us, if you daven for others, you'll see Yeshua even before them. Well, you have to explain how that works and what that is. On the other hand, you're kind of a small chaver that's left. If they get married before you, you kind of feel you're going to be, you, know, so you want them to get married. You really do want them to get married, but you don't necessarily want them to get married before you. Right, right. I talk to people a lot about this when I'm on the other side listening to people. It's, it's, a, it's a normal human emotion. I think it's a valid, it doesn't sound so doesn't sound so gishmak, but the truth you is say it's, it out a, loud. it's a nor- <laughs> no, but it's a normal feeling. But that yeah. night I, I said to myself, you know what? Like it's all in the Bala Shalom's hands. I'm going to daven sincerely for like the seven guys that were part of my chevra that were not yet married in that kufa. And I really daven for each and every one of them. And then I daven for myself. And then when we finished, there was a requit going on right outside the, the Ola there. Of these yeshiva bacharim, so I joined, I joined the circle, and my taxi driver, his name is Yaakov, Yaakov Gershon, he's watching, and he's going close to your name, almost not really <laughs> close. So he says, uh, he's like, and he margish mashu koresham. I feel like something's happening here. He's like, it's like eleven thirty at night. Six people are dancing in front of the kever of Yontam and Ozil singing, etc. And uh, we slept all the way back to Yerushalayim that night. We were singing the Gudim together. We were besties. When well, Misa, the very, very next night, I was going to visit my uh, my my former roommate uh, from America who had made Aliyah, married mm-hmm. children. His name is Daniel Barron, his wife, Esti. And I knew she was going to try to rep me a shidduch because that was the Kedarka. That's what she always did. And I had made up my mind that I'm here for seven days. Like, I'm Amish. It's a Sarasim I'm Yitruva. Not, I'm not going on it. Right. Date here. It right. doesn't make You're any sense. To, to relax make any sense. and be in the Israel zone. And I knew she was going to suggest some girls, and she did suggest the two girls. One of the two that she mentioned was from Vienna, Austria. Now, I'll be honest, I didn't even know where Vienna, Austria was. I just, I you know, people confuse Australia and Austria. I'm like, <laughs> that a lot. It's like a famous thing. But I, I really, I'm not like, I wasn't such a buck in, in Europe at that kufa of my life. Uh, I just didn't even know where Vienna was, but it sounded pretty exotic. Some people think it sounds disgusting. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, obviously a lot of very bad history right. uh, in Vienna. But, Pretty sure Hitler's from Vienna, no? Uh, he's uh, from Austria, yeah. yeah. yeah there you go. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's so, the history. Uh, there we no, go. No, there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, very poor history. Yeah, it's not not to be proud of. I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm close to Moshe Weinberger. And when I when I was about to get married to my wife, I before we got engaged, I brought I brought Ruchi to meet with Rav Weinberger. And and, 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 she's, and his father was in Mauthausen, oh, gosh. Which, is in, which is right outside of, right right. Outside of Vienna. And I, he was like, he was like, where are you from? Like, I was like, like I saw, I just like, it just did not, right. <laughs> it did not stay with him at all. <laughs> but okay, I, I don't mean to make light of it, but it's just something I always remember. I was like a little bit uncomfortable. Even. Right. Like, I probably right. should have told him beforehand. Like, right. You know, but uh, yeah. So, so you're read to two girls, one of them from Vienna. And, and one was from the United States. Okay. And uh, not from New York. It was and, a little bit. But you, but you didn't want to date then. So what, what happened? You're like, mm. I didn't want to, but it sounded really interesting. Like, what she was doing was interesting. She was writing for the Jerusalem Post at that point. She was like wanting to be a writer. She was from Vienna. There were a few other things just, just it made it sound a little bit intriguing. And um, I wasn't so keen on it, but I said, you know what? Like, you know, if she's available and she's local, like, and, and Esty, my friend's wife was like, I'm not even sure she's around this and that. I'm like, okay, find out. Like, it was pretty, it was a pretty light commitment. And then the next day she called me, she's like, you know, you can go out like this afternoon if you well, want. She was in, she was in Israel. She, she lived, she, she was, yeah, she was living in Israel at that time. Mm-hmm. And I was living in America. Esty was concerned. Maybe she had gone back to Vienna for Yantif. She wasn't even sure if she was around or not, but she happened to be around. So she was going back for circus, but she was still around, I think, for that week. And we ended up going out three times during that uh, during that period of Asera Semechuva. And it was pretty good. Like, there was a connection there. But I was going back to America. I'm 31. And uh, I you don't had know. a job. I was working in a law firm. Right. right? Like, and I didn't know the next time I was even going to see this girl. I mean, it, it was good, but it wasn't like... It stars was, and when you're fireworks. Th- you know, whatever. You know, when, you're, when you've got out with so many people and you're at that stage, right. you're definitely not just... I mean, I, I can't speak for everybody. I wasn't just going to be like, you know, I wasn't the type who was going to marry somebody after three dates. So I kind of said to her something like, <clears throat> I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but like, you're very lovely. But I think, I, you know, I'm going back to America. I'm going to continue dating because, I, you know, I can't like, I don't know, you know, whatever. And uh, that was basically it, you know. And then 
my mazel was that she uh, she called me back, and she said that uh, she spoke to her parents and they they were asking him that she can come to, like she can fly to America like after Sukkot for a week to visit with her mishpacha here. She was in Hebrew University in college there, and they were starting mm-hmm. like a week after Sukkot. So she had some time, so she figured, you know, like why don't she just come and let's see, you know, if things would continue. And then that turned out to be a, a big siyata uh, deshmai because that week we spent a lot of time here. It it picked up a lot more momentum. And, and, you know, fat, this goes back 17. There wasn't like Zoom and like even Skype. Like we couldn't even like see each other. It was right. like there wasn't texting. It was it was a different universe. When you came back and she was still there, <laughs> that time that you spent the part, you mean? So subsequent, right, subsequent to her coming to the States and right. us kind of strengthening the Kesher. Now she's going back to Israel. I was at that point, I was willing to commit and come, you know, for Thanksgiving, which was like five weeks later to see her again. Right. But for that five week period, right. we just had to like talk on the phone and like negotiate the time differences, mm-hmm. write emails to each other. There was email. We wrote mm-hmm. emails. In fact, when we got married, I, nothing like a good email date. <laughs> no, what I, what, what I get when we got married, I gave her when we got engaged, I gave her like a book of like all the emails from the beginning of our oh, relationship nice. to, to the end. And was like an interesting just to see the, the development. But in terms, I think the Seattle, I think you were interested a little bit more in the taxi driver part a little bit. So that night in Amuka, I had been macabre on myself like uh, two things. I had mekabal on myself to give a certain amount of money that stuck off for Achnas Hashas and Bakala. I had been mekabal on myself as well to start giving a shear. I had been working as a lawyer and I just didn't have the time or the framework really to teach Torah formally, but I love to teach Torah. And I thought to myself, you know, that would be a good Kabbalah, maybe a to, to to move this along. And uh, and those things happen like pretty quickly. Also, like I went back to our Israel Thanksgiving time, and we, we things kind of solidified. We we basically were ready to get engaged, <clears throat> and I was able to be Makai and my my neder to give staka for Achnas. But all these things happened just like very fluidly. Like things came my way, mm-hmm. like a sheer came, like, came to me, and it was like it just felt like a, a sim and tov. And then and we got we got engaged about Hanukkah time in America, and. I went back to Eretz Yisrael subsequent to Hanukkah for Lachayim with her family, etc. And amazingly, my taxi driver Yaakov picked up my my kala, my wife, and my mother-in-law in the street of Yerushalayim randomly. What? And he overhears them talking that they're like getting prepared for a for an event for a for Lachayim. So he goes, "Mia Chatan, why are you so sad? Let's go to Muka." No. <laughs> he goes, goes "Mia Chatan," and they're like, uh, "David Cohen." He's like, "You're like which David Cohen?" He's like, "David Cohen in New York." <laughs> and they they, they hopped at that. Now, it, what, what stares us a little bit is that I've been to Harry Tassel many, many times subsequent to this, and we've actually randomly picked him up a number of times. So what? there aren't that many taxi drivers in Yerushalayim, <laughs> so it kind of a little bit mitigates the power of the story. But but at that moment... But he didn't know. He had no clue. He just... Your, your, your didn't, he, Kala yeah. goes in the car, and, and he's like, who are you engaged to? Was he at your wedding? So he, call, yeah, so he called me. He called me. He's like, you're not going to believe what happened. David, you're not going to believe what happened. He was at our chasna. Yeah, we have him in our wedding pictures. Really? And not only that, but, you know, we've, we're have we still be kesher. You know, he's on my WhatsApp. You know, we talk. We're, we're friends on different... Uh, How many meetings. people do you think he took to Amuka? How many people do you think he walked into his cab? He said, why you look so sad? The guy's got the biggest <laughs> smile on his face ever. He's like, he's like one what? out of a thousand. It finally worked. <laughs> <laughs> well, nice. I did... I did uh, I did pub before I published it in the book. I published it in other venues, and I had on the bottom like to contact Yaakov Grisha oh, nice. <laughs> with his number. So, you know, you, so, so you send us a picture. We'll put it up on the anyone who's watching this. Maybe we'll put it on YouTube. Yeah, I want to give Yaakov the. I want to give him the chance that he missed in Mishpacha magazine over a second. So <laughs> if we could give him a little PR, that would be great. That's really sure. incredible. That's really cool. We'll be right back with the rest of this episode. But guys, first we want to talk to you about drugs. Mm. AMR Pharmacy. Uh. Guys, some people might think, you might think, I might have thought that you don't need to have like a pharmacy in your corner. You could just run to the nearest pharmacy. You could change every few seconds. But the quality of life, the efficiency of having a pharmacy in your corner that you can trust, that can be loyal, that you can rely on, it's like marriage. Mm. I was going to compare it to Shul. Like you could it's always, like shul you could always dive in like by marriage. that mean that, but like if you really want to grow, you want to connect. You say like, okay, I know my rub, I know my minion, I know my place. Like that's how you get to the next level. Right. With with like what you're saying, Nach, AMR Pharmacy. You know you know them, and they know you. It's free delivery. they they know your background. If you need help, it, it, oh, I you know I my thing didn't come. They're gonna be there for you. And, and there's always instances 
or if you didn't have, you might hopefully nothing too serious, but you're going to need something quick and, and AMR, you know who they are and that should be their slogan. You know who we are. No, more than we, that, know, we know, we know who they are. They, you know who they are, but they know who you are. Oh uh-huh. my gosh. Uh-huh. We're not getting paid enough to do this branding package for gosh. AMR pharmacy guys. Head to amrfarmrx.com. I don't need to spell it cause you already know what it is. Or you can call 848-222-1110. You'll be put in touch with the best pharmacy in the world. Like we said in this little tidbit, it's like marriage. It's like a shul, and it's so necessary to have in your life. I you, we had Robert Ginsburg, right? Yeah. Um, last week and two weeks ago, two weeks ago, and um, he he was mentioning how when he was you know he woke up in the hospital after COVID. It's a great episode if you didn't listen to it. I mean, it's a great episode even if you did listen to it. He's amazing, and he was saying how he thought he was nurse to stroll, and but like certain things he did remember. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't happen to like to anyone obviously what he went through but like on a way smaller note if i was ever like hit on my head and they're like they, the first thing they should say is like what's amr's phone number i'll be like 848-222-1110 right. like i'll know it it's in my head already hopefully it's in everyone's heads and also. i'm sure it's in yours also mm-hmm. guys so hope you make that phone call make that switch and mazel tov <laughs> it's like marriage you get it uh, um, okay, fine. So, so you you get married to your wife, and you would start off living in Eretz Yeah, together. We, uh, yeah. She that was a pre a precondition of our getting married on some level. She was living in Eretz She grew up in Europe. She went to high school here in the states. She then went to a seminary in Israel, and she went to college in Israel. And her plan was to stay in Eretz That was her plan. And uh, I guess I was appealing enough on some level that she was willing to veer from that a little bit, but. The, the I think the I think the assumption was let's start in Eretz Yisrael mm-hmm. and maybe we'll mm-hmm. maybe we'll stay. That was kind of like things, and I wasn't wasn't adverse to that. I had this passion to come back and go into Rabbanus, but who knows if you know life could have taken us a different direction. So we spent the first almost three years of married life so, so in Eretz So that's the moment, really. At, you know, you're 31 years old and you had invested time into becoming a lawyer and working for a nice law firm, and then you just you dropped that, I imagine. <clears throat> so I dropped law exactly. I left my law firm uh, right before my right before my wedding. We got married like Rosh Chodesh Nissan, like right. I was like a fourth year associate at Fried Frank. Told them I was uh, was leaving the firm, moving to Israel, starting a whole new track. I went to learn in this like very yeshivish kollel, which was a whole new experience to me. You have to realize also I had been out of yeshiva for many years now, and now I'm going back to learn in this very intense place that was probably the most intense option. That it's was like a, it's unusual. It's unusual for that to happen. Do you think? Do you think that's like unusual to as like 31 years old go back to yeshiva after working as a lawyer? I think that many people envision, I can't, I don't know, maybe this is relevant to you guys as well. I think many people envision for themselves, particularly people that are serious about learning, starting off married life involved in full-time Talmud Torah. Rav Herschel Schechter, who was my Rosh Kol in, in YU many years ago, he used to always say that you can't really know your kochos and learning until you're married because the different Yishev Hadas that you have. Mm-hmm. I took that very seriously. Unfortunately, it just didn't happen for me in the time frame right. that was normal. And therefore, but I had in the back of my head, if, I've, if I'm in a position to do this, and because I had worked for a number of years and I had some money put away, I wasn't in a position to do it. I always had in my head. I don't care. I, I mean, I mean, maybe at a certain juncture it would have been unrealistic. But at that juncture, it made sense. You know? and, and I also pivoted at that time into the world of psychology because I had done a lot of uh, introspective work on myself in the years becoming, getting married, trying to get married. So then I kind of, I went to actually get a master's in psychology at that point because I felt that would be very useful to me going forward as well. So you just, you sacrificed a lot. I mean, like it's it's many years into going to profession and then having a good job and then to just drop it. I mean, what did you tell them you're, you'll come back or you just cut ties? Yeah, I cut ties. I mean, these very, very big firms are like revolving doors. So I mean, that 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 piece of it, it's not like you're working in a small place right. and like they're counting on you. It's like I'm one of like 500. You know, it's like, in that sense, it wasn't. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that was such a, a big deal. Uh, a, a topic like there's there's like like seven more things I want to discuss with you, and I know we're like halfway there. But um, your first child, um, at w- what year did you have your your first child? So your son. Yudidya, his name yeah. is Yudidya. So Yudidya was born uh, about a year and a half after we were married. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know, maybe even less than that. Like we were married a little over a year. And uh, I think my wife, well, I guess we can do the math. My wife became pregnant, I think about six months after we were married. And uh, it was, an, you know, as far as we knew, it was a normal pregnancy. 
Uh, he didn't kick as, as much as some of our subsequent children did. But, uh, you know, we were very excited. You know, we, we happened to find out we were having a boy. Uh, all the different uh, testing up to the birth went very smoothly. In fact, we went for this, uh, it's called Skirat Marachot, this big sonogram in Israel midway where they do a, like a very detailed study of the baby. And the, and, the, and the sonographer was so impressed. He asked us for permission to hang it on his like... Uh, in his uh, waiting room there to show his beautiful handiwork. And he, and he Dafka said, I don't know why he said this. He said, there's no sign of Down syndrome. I was like, we weren't talking about Down syndrome. Why did he even say there's no sign of Down mm. syndrome? It was like so interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, came the ninth month and uh, the baby was not in the right position for a natural birth. And we went uh, different things, Rabbanim, Brachos. Uh, it's called a hipuch. There's like a procedure in Israel where they try to turn. My, my wife is actually a midwife. She's like a pro in all these things. I don't, right. I don't, I don't know what these things are. I'm just talking. <laughs> but uh, when my so we had a we had a cesarean. We had a cesarean. My wife had a cesarean section. The baby came out in Sharetzedek Hospital, and I can tell that the the Mazel tubs in the room were a little bit uh, not as strong as they should have been. I just felt something was amiss. My wife was like lying on the operating table. She's not so aware of what's going on. They they rushed her for, you know, afterwards for recuperation, et cetera. And I'm kind of standing there in my scrubs and like, I don't know what's flying. And I went over to the doctor and I said, is everything okay? And the doctor was kind of like, uh, I, whatever, it's not so important, but the doctor didn't say something that was, the doctor didn't say anything that was particularly uh, comforting. Right. And then uh, a few minutes later, I walked into one of the rooms and it was somebody there like, playing around with my son and he was like is this your son i'm like i think so yeah and he was like like got very serious and like very austere and he basically started showing me like different signs of down syndrome he's like you know your son has down syndrome i was like i didn't even know what that meant i mean i worked in camp Ask as a counselor for many summers like i knew a little bit what that was but i didn't really i mean at that moment it was just like what <laughs> and just to set the tone for you even more I, I didn't think of this i guess i probably did think of this bishaito but Friends of mine have recently uh, brought this back just in, in different contexts. Like for people that were rooting for me all the years to get over the hump and get married and really cared about me, they were devastated that this happened to me because he finally got married. He finally got over the hump, just wants to be normal and start a family like everybody else. And this is what happens to him. Like, you know, and, and may, I'm sure I felt that, you know, Bishaito uh, as well like a double whammy, uh, like an unfairness of sorts. Uh, but that, you know, you know, fast forward, you know, you did just 15 years old today, you know, fast forward, you know, that transformed our lives in, in uh, enormously positive ways that we could never, ever have anticipated uh, at, that, uh, at that particular juncture, that particular moment in time. What's, what's the, I guess, emotional adjustment that you had to make from, you know, I guess anticipating simcha and happiness and I guess it still is a happy time that you had a child but it was just a snap of a finger it went from we're having a, a perfect healthy baby boy to our life as you knew it is going to change forever <clears throat> what's what's that emotional adjustment like it's a big adjustment it's a big big adjustment again I, I kind of grabbed on to tefillah talking to the Bono Shalom I'm I'm a big tefillah guy. I really am. It's like something that I feel like I feel it's a, a real weapon that we have in our arsenal, and it's something that I find for me it's soothing and comforting. Like I think, look, I think so much of life is like we we worry about what other people think of us. We worry about perceptions. Uh, if you kind of just get out of all that nonsense and just kind of be real, like in a moment, like you know, and it, you're asking me two questions. I mean, I want to answer it properly, mm -hmm. but you know, from a uh, from out, from being outside of it now, it's a simcha. Right. It's really a simcha. And if you can be in the moment and not worry about all the ramifications down the road, you have a beautiful baby. You did was was the most gorgeous baby. That and no offense to my other children, <laughs> but he was really a gorgeous, gorgeous baby, and we had such joy from him. We still do every moment of life, but in those early months, we had incredible. Nachas from him, but 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 what what stared what stared was that oh my God what's going to be when he's thirty yet he's ever going to make it married and, and, da, da, and da, 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 da. what's going to be with our lives and all that overwhelms you and that's why it becomes not such a simcha. 
I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to mitigate that it's a difficult thing. It's a terrible no, thing. 100%. And it took me many months to kind of get out of that like uh, shock. That, what, did it? What, yeah, it? absolutely. It was just kind of like, cause you get thrown right away. <clears throat> it's not like, it's no different than any, any tragedy that unexpectedly uh, transpires. And I mean, I know you know about this yourself right. and your own uh, family, extended family. I don't, I don't, not to compare anybody's situations. I think any time the Rebbe Shalom throws you for an unexpected loop, one has to uh, one has to reorient. One has to uh, get their get their bearings. And I know for myself, there were it was uh, look. I was still newly married. Like it wasn't like my wife and I knew each other for so many years. There were so many different uh, concerns, and you don't know about are you going to be able to have other children? Are the other children going to be going to be, uh, they're going to be healthy. Are they not going to be healthy? Do we have some sort of genetic problem that this happened, et cetera? You, there's a lot of learning that goes on. And then like, you, you know, you get the facts and you understand that it's on some of, it's not a fluke, but it's like, it's not a genetic thing. It just happens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then you begin to embrace the the task and uh, you galvanize yourself and you get chizik from other people that are similarly situated. I remember that uh, <clears throat> a lot of people reached out to me I saw a picture, I see have a book here from Rabbi Kron, mm -hmm. Rabbi Pesel Kron, I'm a big fan of, uh, so his brother, Rav Kalman, Zuchon al Racha. I think Rav Kalman had like 17, 18 children, I don't know exactly, but like one of his last children had Downs and autism. So he called me from Lakewood to Eretz Yisrael <clears throat> to try to give me chizik. I was inconsolable. I was like, I was a such a lamb. I remember he called me and I, poor guy, I didn't know him. <laughs> he met well, he starts telling me like, you know, my child has Downs and autism. I said, yeah, but that's your 18th child. This is my first child. Like, I, I just couldn't, I right. couldn't, like, like and, and, and not to criticize, but there's a, there's an art in how you talk to people and what you say to them. You have to, you, you know, mm -hmm. you mean well when you're calling a stranger, but you also have to get the framework of who you're talking to, what you should right. say, what you shouldn't say. Like, again, no time is on him. I'm just explaining that, that uh, it's an art form. But yeah, 100%. It, it, you know, I didn't just like, I remember though, a few weeks later, <laughs> just laughing, I remember this, like a few weeks later, we lived in Harnof. There were a lot of children with, with Down syndrome in Harnoff, Lamaisa, and we, somebody else that we didn't really know also had a, a first child with Down syndrome. And it was a Shalom Zachar. And we went to the Shalom Zachar. It was like a month after Yididu was born. And I walked into the Shalom Zachar. I promise you, the father was like leaning out the window, like vomiting. Mm. That's how sick he was. Now, what, what was the shot? This was a very, very Haredi family. If you live in the, in the in a world of, we talked a little bit at the beginning about modern orthodox. Yeah. You know, I think it's different. Modern orthodox yeshivish in America is different than Haredi America as well. It's a much bigger right. discussion, much more complex discussion, much more nuanced discussion. But in this particular part of it, this, uh, this Avreich, who is, if you, if your whole Weltanschauung and your whole Gestalt in life is becoming Reb Chaim Kenievsky or bust, so then if you have a child with Down syndrome, that's very difficult to be so though. Now again, I'm talking about I'm talking about one situation. I can't, I'm, right. not, I'm not, I don't mean to, I'm sure that I don't mean to generalize at all. But at that point already, we had kind of, we were in a better place. We see this a lot. We do, my wife and I deal with a lot of families who are similarly situated to give them chizuk, to give them guidance. And it's interesting, so much of things is perspective. Like what's your perspective? We made certain decisions early on that we weren't gonna let this dominate our lives, that we were gonna have other children, that we were gonna try to, and, and that's worked for us. There are other people that that they put in everything into the child or or the, or, well, you know, the other way, they, they don't deal with the child. There's all different mahalchim and, and approaches, but we've seen many times that like, everybody has different perspectives on it. And certainly if you're not in the sugya, like many things, it's hard to understand. But even when you're in the sugya, there's different ways to, to to perceive it and approach it and it's almost I, I start, it's almost comical sometimes when you're in the same situation and you see things so differently than somebody else so like this guy he's like vomiting and i was in pain in my sham zakhar too i remember marshiva came and we sang but it was beautiful and it was uplifting and i think i'm not not better or worse it's just different just different so uh, i want to fast forward a little now to your what you had 10 years you were you were in Manhattan for? I was a rabbi of a shul called the Young Azul, the West Side, for nine years. Nine years. Uh, we came uh, from this three-year tkufa in Eretz Yisrael. We had Yedidya and, and our daughter, who were born, our daughter was born like six weeks before we moved to the States. I got a position to go into Rabbanos. And we spent we spent 11 years living on the West Side. Nine of those years, I was the rub of the Young Israel. I also worked in that kufa at Yeshiva University, at Stern College, at Lander College for Women. I was... Uh, 
משפיע, משגיח, teacher, professor, and all these different contexts. And different you wear places. a lot of hats. That's what it seems like. Yeah. <laughs> different things. You know, sometimes there was just need for extra parnasa at different times, and sometimes it was just, uh, I, I, you know, if, they're all different types of shuls. Maybe, again, I don't know the cheshbonus or the rona shalom, but, but I, I tended to be in shuls that weren't, uh, you know, they were, they t- I, my, my pulpits have tended to be young families. Mm. Young families are a different dynamic. You don't have like levias, six levias a week. You don't have the life cycle, heavy life cycle, heavy duty stuff that, that a lot of my chaverim have kind of, let's say, in, 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 in let's say more established congregations. So there was a little more free time on my, on my hands to kind of dabble in other things. You, you'd be mm-hmm. bored otherwise. Right. So, uh, so yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So, so what, Manhattan for so what was, what was that like being, being a, a rub there for nine years? Upper West Side is a, is a great place. Like we really loved, we loved our time there. It's hard to stay there, you know, in perpetuity just because it's, it's a very transient community and it's exorbitant, putting aside COVID and all the things that have devastation that's occurred in Manhattan recently. But my wife grew up in Vienna, so she's like a city girl. Like mm. she loved living in, and if there was anywhere she was going to live outside of Eretz Israel, Upper West Side of Manhattan or maybe Upper East Side of Manhattan were definitely attractive. You know, it gets a bad rap, the Upper West Side. People think it's like a place where... A lot of singles go. It's like people are mistovev over there. It's not really, you know. There's some incredible families that have been living on the Upper West Side for 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 decades, right. generation to generation. There's very rich history there. Yeah, I mean that's an interesting word, rich. No pun like, right? <laughs> but it's uh, but it's uh, but it's a community that's that's mali chesed. It's mali v'gadosh b'tayra. If the people I met coming through there, just Gedol Yisrael that were visiting, you know, the, the tremendous Gvirim and the philanthropists and relationships that were built. Plus also working with young married families. And I can say that I literally, we probably have thousands of people at our Shabbos table. We, you know, we've, again, these, it's a strange, like these aren't our Balabatim because they came and went and now like they're spread out across America. But many of them I'm still very much Bekesha with and have relationships with and, you know, I've been able to fast forward in terms of the work I do now with Yachad and, and other things I do. So like these are relationships that I'm able to, 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 to build on and to, and to call from because of that foundation that was built on the Upper West Side. So it was a great, it was a great time of our lives. We were, we were young, we had young kids and uh, it was, a, we could just hop on a subway and go to any restaurant we wanted. It was, it was, it was great. It was really, uh, it was a very convenient, great time. Very different than like having, we don't know, we have cars now and a house. Mm. It's a whole different uh, not, that they, not that there are no cars on the West Side, but I find like people don't have cars there because it's more of a hassle to be parking your car than to just jumping on subways or... Yeah, 100%. There was, uh, Zipcar was big, actually. Yeah. Like, they ever had to go somewhere. Like, now there's Uber too, I mean, but uh, yeah, we, we didn't we didn't own a car all those years. It was like so funny when we moved here, we had to like get not one, but two cars. It was like, we had to deal with all these things. It was like, well, what's like, what's this? I didn't remember how this stuff went, but it was the the rub before you was was an older. What was the name? Wasn't it was Rabbi Emanuel Gettinger? Is a of Racha. Rabbi Gettinger is a famous famous Talmud Chacham and a exceptional person. He was the one of the prime one of the first Talmud of Rabbi the famous Rosh of Chaim Berlin. He was really like Rabbi Gettinger was like a mamish like an Eloy. He was the Rebbe to. Uh, I know you know Rabbi Feiner. He was like the Rebbe to Rabbi Feiner's father, Doctor Feiner at mm. Columbia University. Like mm-hmm. he was, he was a he was gift shirim in Columbia University. He also had like very sophisticated background in mathematics and sciences, and he had higher degrees in these things as well. He was, he was like, it was like a little bit of a. In his early years on the West Side, he had like the Young Israel was like the shul. It was like in the in the fifties and sixties, it was like the shul. Like, but there's a lot of things change on the West Side. But I came there. He was in his early eighties, and we worked together for five years. We built a very special relationship. It was very. Uh, it was it was delicate. Like you had to, you have to know how to handle kind of working with an older rav. But uh, on a personal level, we had a very uh, very close relationship, a meaningful relationship. Interestingly enough, his his grandson. Yitzi Gettinger came uh, subsequent to me at the at the Young Israel, and actually is the rub there now. 
So there's actually oh, like really? a hemshech in all the, in the history of the Young Israel of the West Side, which has existed for, I don't know, probably 75, 80 years now, there's really been only three Rabbanim. There's been Rabbi Emanuel Gettinger, there was uh, David Kohn, and now there's Rabbi Yitzhak Gettinger. I mean, there are a lot of shuls where you can uh, where you can say that or point to that. There's a, it's a historical fact that there was one other rabbi also. There was a rabbi. right? Yeah, Rabbi I read in your book. Oh, I, okay. I don't know. Rabbi, I just, it's, it's an interesting fact for people that follow these things. Rabbi Yaakov Sprung, who was a rabbi in West Orange, New Jersey, and who was a rabbi in Australia. Uh, I don't know where he is now. I think he's in the Bible Maybe he's back in the States. He's actually rabbi. He was rabbi, he was the son-in-law of Rabbi Yaakov Weinberg, where she was in there as well. Mm. So he was the acting rabbi for a year when Rabbi Gettinger went on sabbatical, like in the 1970s. So if anybody ever asks, it's really, there were like it's four rabbis. Fun, I guess so. fun fact <laughs> history right yeah. there. So so you mentioned Yachad. So what, what's your role at Yachad now? What do you do for Yachad? So when we moved back to the States, we had a child with uh, special needs, with Down syndrome. And we had to kind of figure out uh, where to get support, what resources were available. Dr. Jeffrey Lichman, who was the uh, founder of Yachad and the longtime head of Yachad, was somebody who was very instrumental for us, came to our apartment, spoke to us for hours, gave us chizuk, talked to us about educational opportunities. And we started going in Yachad Shabbatonim. We went, originally we went, Yedidu was so little and we felt very out of place. So we waited a couple more years to kind of get more involved. But as you did, you got older. Uh, he benefited greatly from Yachad's, Yachad's programming and uh, summer programs and Shabbatonim. And then they got wind of the fact that I was a rabbi and I can speak a little bit. So they began asking me to get involved as a lay leader, to be on the board, to speak. And then things are mit galgel and things happen. After I left the Young Israel, the West Side, so I was brought to the OU actually to do consulting for shuls and to focus on kind of helping the OU shuls. And that was my focus for two years. But I always had the soft spot for Yachad. And it, was, it's, it seemed counterintuitive for me to be at the OU and not be involved with Yachad. So a little bit on the side, while I was really focused mainly on shuls, I was doing a little bit of work for Yachad. And then after a couple of years of the OU, it just it made sense to me and to them that I should spend more of my time really involved in Yachad. There was an opportunity for me to get involved in, in really developing partnerships and raising resources for the amazing transformative work that Yaha does. And for the last three years, I've really been spending the bulk of my time at the OU uh, raising money, raising money to help support uh, the myriad of programs that we do both across North America and in Israel, uh, supporting individuals with special needs as well as their families. More recently, how, uh, has, has, how difficult has that been to be able to raise <clears throat> funds in, in, this, in this new world that we're living in? It's interesting. It's interesting. I was very afraid at the beginning. Like this is this is going to be a colossal disaster from a fundraising standpoint. In truth, it's yesh for yesh. Meaning, if you were starting from scratch now, you know, good luck to you. Right. But I was fortunate that I had cultivated and built relationships over a number of years already. So there was there were go to people. I I think that the. When you're a fundraiser, you're always kind of, there's always a balance between continuing to grow your current relationships. Cultivating new ones, yeah. And cultivating new ones. Cultivating new ones in this milieu is not easy because there's almost no framework to meet people, right? There's no mm -hmm. social events. There's no dinners that you're going right. to hang you out. You bump and, into someone. Like, they have a right. mask, you have a master stand six feet right. apart. So, so that piece of it is incredibly challenging, but you do have, hopefully you have a strong base already. And then and then there, it's what I said, it's yesh yesh, meaning there, there are people who have been hit very hard, obviously and businesses have been uh, decimated, particularly people with their own small businesses, et cetera. So a lot of those donors, you kind of just have to be, you know, you reach out to them, you're their friend, you support them, you thank them for all they've done in the past, and you hope that they'll be able to help you in the future, Bez Hashem. But frankly, there are people in our community who have probably done better than ever during COVID right. based on different uh, opportunities and things that came their way. And those people are in a position to be able to help. So. Uh, you know, it's not easy, but at the same time, I, I think the focus of people has changed. I have, I have my own podcast where I, where it's called the Jewish philanthropy podcast. And I, mm -hmm. I, I interview a lot of, uh, mega philanthropists and I try to, a lot of raising money is understanding people, like kind of what speaks to them. You know, it's, it's interesting. A lot of people I've, I'm doing a safer Torah campaign right now for Yachad and I'm hearing from a lot of people that it's not speaking to them. And I'm saying, well, why isn't this speaking? Like, maybe it's an opportunity, it's an opening. You always have to understand, like the donor, what what does speak to them, or why is this not speaking to them? Because when you can, when you really figure out how to hone in on what's their thing, you'll get all the money you need, assuming they have it. It's just a question of 
figuring out kind of what speaks to that person. It's, it's the skill of listening, which is something that I think I'm decent at. And it's something that I, I value a great deal, which is really listening to what other people are saying. I think if you have that skill in life, you can do a lot of different things really, really well. If someone, if someone came to you and they said, I need to raise, you know, $18,000 for this special program that I'm running. What are three, you know, tips and fundraising that you would give them off the bat to go ahead and I guess be successful. Interesting. So I, I was I was in Eretz actually in March, right before, right before COVID really broke. My brother made a simple. It was my nephew's bar mitzvah. Mm-hmm. I came back from Eretz Yisrael. We had Purim, COVID. So people were already wearing masks on the plane. I was like, why are they wearing masks? It's like bizarro. But, but I, I learned very quickly that it wasn't bizarro. Right. But I just didn't know what was going on, really, honestly. So when I was in Eretz Yisrael, I stayed by my brother-in-law in, in Ramat Beit Shemesh for Shabbos. And he was starting yeshiva that again, because of COVID things didn't go, but he asked me exactly this question. He's like, well, how do you, you know, I'm starting to become an executive director of this yeshiva. I got to raise money. Like what's, you know, what, what would you tell me? So uh, first thing you got to know, like, you know, who does your project speak to? Meaning, so you're starting a, you're starting a yeshiva, for example. So you have people that are interested in this yeshiva, you wouldn't be starting it. So you, you've had parlor meetings, you've had some base. So identify in that chevra of people that are, that have bought into what you're trying to do into your enterprise, who are they? You got, it's easier than ever today to do research, right? With, with Google and with the internet, you can, you can figure out pretty quickly who's who, you know, so you, you what they at, like to eat, what they <laughs> like to drink. That too, by the way, <laughs> that too also, but you can Seth, you can definitely figure out if somebody's uh, grandfather or somebody's parent in that group, but even if it's young families, somebody there might be a mega philanthropist. You know, it might be right. a famous name or they might just be someone who's not a famous name, but you realize that there are resources there. So you, you always have to identify kind of where the resources is. You, you can spend, like you asked me earlier about spending so much time on law and then you have nothing to show from it. You don't want to spend a ton of time cultivating a person who, no fault of their own, but they're, that's not your prospect. Like if they don't have the, if they don't have the means to help you, you're not, you're not shooting in the right direction, right? right. So <clears throat> I think you have to kind of identify who, what you're doing speaks to, do they have the capacity to help you? And then you have to work on kind of framing what the ask is, how do you make it meaningful to them? And then there's a whole avoda that's a much longer schmooze, like how do you, how do you get the meeting with them? How do you get in front of them? How do you, how do you get their attention? How do you get the opportunity to make your presentation? And frankly, people will say no very frequently. No, it's not the right time. More, so, more, more frequently than yes, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like no just means not right now <laughs> in general. And if you don't believe that, then you can't really fundraise. <laughs> no, I mean, you have to be, ve- I happen to be a pretty persistent person. You are. I mean, I, I'm <laughs> going to say it like, you know, you reached out to us on, on LinkedIn, which you have a cool LinkedIn profile. He, he's yeah. Michelle Obama, Macaulay Culkin, a few other cool <laughs> celebrities. <laughs> but, Culkin. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you mentioned, and like Nachi and I were just like busy, you know, so many people are on a list and, and then you actually dropped off your, yeah, your book Yeah, I walked in us. one day and there was two books on the desk. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, we, like, we read them, yeah. and like, you know, start schmoozing with you. And I'm like, wow, you're actually, I mean, obviously you're a great guest, but um, I, I really admired your persistency. Thank you. I think it, that's cute. Persistency is a word? Persistency. That's a word? Yeah. Persistency. Uh, I'm not sure. Persistence. <laughs> That's good. Why can't we make it a word? It's not a word? Okay, great. Now a, my wife's going to kill me I'm and a, my mother. You know, it's, I'm a big believer in life we'll that you it have, it to, you have like to go. It. It's a great example. It's, yeah. a, it's actually it. a great example because I saw what you guys were doing. I found, I, found it to be, I found it to be meaningful. No pun intended. I really was gaining a lot from the guests that you were having. And not all Skyva, but I felt I had what, I felt I could add to the discussion. I felt I have a story to share. But I frankly... How would you possibly, uh, I'm not on your radar. Like, I don't know you guys, you don't know me. So why would you possibly, unless somebody would say to you, you should have this guy on your show. Why would you, why would Which by the way, it happens a lot. Like I would say probably like 98% of people that are like, should be on the show. We want to have them. Just like, we don't like, there's only so much time we have to like do research and find out people. And, uh, no, hundred percent. And I, I recognize that. And, happened to be, it was a a little bit of Siat of the Shmaya. Like I, it was on my radar, like something that I would like to do. But I like, I wasn't going to like, it wasn't, it wasn't so important to me that I was going to like right. go crazy about it. But then a friend of yours happened to reach out to me on LinkedIn, happened to connect us. So I saw that as a, pe- like, that's a siyad of the shema. That's a Pesach to kind of, okay, that's a simon that I should pursue this. Mm. So uh, I reached out to Nach. I said, hey, I'd love to drop off 
you know, copy my book. Yes, yes, no, no. I said to my wife, I said, they'll either, they'll either look at it and they'll like it and they'll reach out to me or they won't. And and that's fine too, you know, and, and Baruch Hashem, we're sitting here. So, so I mean, planting so. that seed is like the important, it's, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's such an important thing. That's the fundraising piece, meaning that's the same thing. You could have, right? you could have, you could have waited like three weeks to bring, to bring the book over and then like, but it was like the next day, you just got it done. I think that's, I think it's, it's good, persistency, which I think is a, is a word. <laughs> they, it, wait, is it a word? It is, yes. Thank you. I think it is. Thank you. It is a word. So you. Yaakov, you're good for now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I see it as a, I see it as a badge of honor a little bit. Like some people will, some people say it's not for them or some people will find it's, it's too forward or it's too, you have to do it tactfully, obviously. It's vulnerable. Yeah. See, like, yeah, you have to make making yourself, yourself open to being rejected in, in so many different ways. Yeah. Uh, well, look, you dated for ten years, so you're probably right. somewhat. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I, I've, I've, I have not had uh, the smoothest pathway in important realms of life. I have a lot of bracha, a lot that I'm thankful for, but I can't say that everything, as we talked about, you know, uh, getting married, which for some people is an easier thing, was not easy for me. Having my first child was not an easy sugya either. I've had uh, professional challenges in other realms as well, just uh, just different uh, situations in, in the rabbit that I've been in that have been beyond my control, but still difficult. And uh, you learn to kind of, you know, to, to gain a thicker skin and to recognize that Rabbi Krohn has a great thing he says uh, that I heard him quote once. He says, uh, SW to the third power over N. It means some will, some won't, so what, next. It's beautiful. SW to the third over N. <clears throat> some will, some won't. So what? Next. So yeah, you have to feel strong enough about yourself that you have you have what to offer, and you have to understand the same thing with fundraising. You know, it's no reflection on my project that Gvir X, Y, or Z is not interested in it. He has other priorities. He has other things tugging on his resources. Nobody has unlimited resources, Kimat. And uh, it's you like try. the hardest thing to do. I, I find. We do a lot of fundraising for Meaningful Minute. It's like the hardest, it's got like, I think like a okay, brain surgeon and fundraising. Same, <laughs> same, same thing. Cause trying to get money from somebody who worked hard to earn that money. And a lot of it is just, it's a difficult thing. So. Nah, okay, I think you should listen to his podcast. I think I will. <laughs> like, I was going to ask. That's, that's I actually, I, I, what I enjoy about it. I, I, I enjoy the chase a little bit. Like there's a little bit of fun in the chase, depending on how annoying you never it is know. or isn't. It's exciting. I find though, generally speaking, most very successful people financially, most, I mean, some people just inherit a boatload of money, not to take away from that. Also, that's a big mm -hmm. bracha, but most people who made their money tend to be very interesting people. They tend to be very smart. Dang it, I'm interesting. Why? Tend hey, to maybe it's going to happen one day to me. <laughs> no, I mean, look, they're, they're obviously very interesting people who, who, are, who put their energies and, and attention elsewhere. But I find that when you get to connect with these people and get to know them and get to hear their life story, which is what I do on my podcast, similar to this, a different, different milieu or different context, there's, you learn a lot. I mean, what are we doing here? I mean, we're, you guys are doing something. You want to learn from inspiring people. Right. These are also inspiring people. It's a different. It's a different milieu. It's a, it's a different. It's a different. You know. It's also a great way for you to sort of. Pitch yeah, don't the, don't pitch give away my secrets. <laughs> it's a great way for you to pitch. Don't them. give away my secrets. <laughs> so um, yes, it's, a, it's definitely a way to meet people that you couldn't meet otherwise. We'll leave it at that. We're, Hopefully, we're, none of them are listening to this podcast. We're, <laughs> <laughs> we're running out of time, but um, you, you mentioned that you, obviously you're, you're Rav now in our. In, in Northwood Mayor, um, and you're you're also a psychologist. Um, something that I wanted to bring up right before we do our like final questions is, what, what's what's the experience of being a psychologist like? With you deal with uh, couple therapy, so I deal with individuals. Oh, individuals as well as okay. as well as well as, as couples. I primarily do focus on couple work. I okay. do a lot of a lot of work with couples, ongoing with different couples. Uh, you know, COVID has been very challenging for a lot of marriages. I find that the the cream rises to the top. People that have strong foundations pre-COVID have generally been able to excel and strengthen during this period. People that were a little bit teetering on the brink beforehand, you can only imagine how being put into different types of crises can only uh, exacerbate and make it much more difficult and much more challenging. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it's, you know, there, and it's, it can be heartbreaking because there are relationships at times that really aren't meant to stay together and maybe could be better, better suited for, you know, I, I worked with a, a couple recently that it was pretty clear to me and frankly to both of them that everybody would be happier 
kind of moving in a different direction. And that's a, that's a very stark realization because we generally try, you know, to Make keep work, people yeah. together. But I've, I've been, I've been mentored by my mentors in, in the real, in, in this world that, you know, you never make a judgment on that. You know, should, should you think I should, do you think, you think we should stay together? You think we should get divorced? I, I can't answer that question. Only you can answer that question. Right. I can try to help you. I can try to help you understand each other better. I can try to help you communicate more effectively. I can try to, if I'm working with one of the couple, I can try to soothe and, and, and comfort and, and heal uh, your pain and your wounds, but I can't, only you can decide, you know, how you want to spend your life and who you want to spend it with. That's I can't really take nice. that power from you. I, I would love to delve into that more, but I, I still want to ask you our, our go-to questions. So first off, do you have a favorite mitzvah? He says with a smile on his face. Yeah. I think it's a great question. So I, I think I, I mentioned, I think I mentioned a few times in our conversation. Uh, I, me- I mentioned to Davening. Yeah. Oh. Tfila, yeah. My kids kind of said to me, I mentioned my daughter's a big fan, so she mentioned to me that Abba, you should say Birkas Kohanim hmm. because you're a Kohen and it's part of davening. But I said, I said it sounds like a cool answer. I'm not sure it's the right answer. Yeah, that's her answer. But, that's uh, not your answer. Exactly. No, my, my answer is my answer is tefillah. My answer is is davening. I love Yom Naram davening. This year, I I, I happen to be a shtickle about tefillah. I usually don't daven for the Amman and Yom Naram except for Ni'ilah because because usually you have to speak and there's a lot of other things you have to do as the rub. So it's like, it's a lot to take that on. And we have Baruch Hashem, beautiful Bali tefillah mm-hmm. that we bring in. So I didn't feel it necessary, but this year, because we split into two minyanim, so there was really a need for additional people to step up. So I did it for the first time this year. I davened uh, both on Rosh Hashanah as well as on Yom Kippur, uh, Musaf. Uh, and it was like, for me, it was like, it was so cool. It was like bringing together all the different years different places I had been over all the years, like growing up in Young as well, West Hempstead, there was Rabbi Mel David with his Nigunim and then Shalavim, Rabbi Arya Hendler and, and his Nigunim. And then I spent some years in YU based measures for davening. Uh, I think Rabbi Kersner was the Baltfila there. I mean, not Shim, um, Shimon something, I'm not saying his name properly, but uh, something very close. Uh, and then, uh, and then the youngest of the West Side had uh, Benji Mandel for so many years. So it was like so many different experiences that I was able to bring to the fore in my own davening, nusuch, nigunim. Uh, it was very uplifting, it was very inspiring, but even day-to-day davening. I just, I, I love the opportunity to, to, to speak to the Rebbe Shalom, to be, uh, to say Shemon Esrei, to talk. Uh, I have <clears throat> something uh, just, I like to daven by Kivrei Tzadikim. When I'm, I mean, as a Kohen, it's limiting on some level, mm-hmm. but to the degree that I'm able to, it's uh, something that uh, we're very close, we live very close to the Yol. The Yol is, uh, the Rebbe's Yol is 15 minutes from where I live. It's Mamish, like uh, the Bachram walk, you know, they walk from the Yol to come visit us in our shul. It takes them an hour, 15 minutes. I haven't walked it yet, but uh, I drive <laughs> there. I try to go once a month to Daven by the Rebbe. It's something that uh, I never was there either in my whole life, like until we moved here. And I was very scared of going, like a kind of strange thing. But then like I went and it was like, it was, uh, it's transformative. It's a very, very powerful thing. I just, uh, it's very powerful. So it's, 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 a, it's a, like I said, it's a weapon, right? Uh, you know, Targum is later on in Sefer Bereshus, we'll get to, but Yaakov, you know, so I mean, it's, it's a powerful thing. So it's something that, that definitely resonates with me. Yeah. If you could sit down with one person from history who's no longer here for one hour, who would it be? Without a doubt, it would be the Babacher Rebbe. Mm. Without a doubt, it'll be the Bava What would you talk to him about? I would, I would, I would tell him where I am right now in life. I would say, Rebbe, what do I do? Where am I going? Yeah, I've done a lot of different things, and yet I still kind of feel, on some level, like I haven't even, haven't even touched the surface. And uh, I don't know. I just, I feel like, <clears throat> I'm saying this to my wife recently. I feel like I just need a big person. To, to say, I believe in you. I believe in, in what you can do. I, I think you should do X. And like, just give me, you know, uh, you know, Weinberger has that story that, uh, yeah, the, that the Rebbe like, just went like this to him, you know, when he was whatever. But like, I just, you know, I've read so much about the Rebbe. I learn his Torah now with a, with a, with a shliach, with a, with a chavrusa of mine, a good friend. Uh, and uh, I just, uh, just read about the stories, the stories, just who he was and, how much he cared for Jews and how he like saw right through people. I just, I don't know. I would love to just sit like in front of the Babacher Rebbe for an hour, like pun him upon him and, uh, and just, uh, hear what he has to say. You know, <laughs> that would be, to me, that would be, uh, 
that would be uh, I, I want, there's a, a little caveat on that question if I may sure that my my grandfather my maternal grandfather Rabbi Mayor Feldman who was a very big impetus in my life he was a pulpit rabbi for many years and he also was a fundraiser he was very influential in my life he inspired and motivated me to pursue the things I pursue but I didn't appreciate him when I had him uh, I was like a teenager and he was trying to get me to move away from sports and focus on more serious stuff and I you know he would even play back he would try to play basketball with me just to like connect you know and I was like well this wasn't my thing you know and then like when I was finally like in my 20s and I was ready to have that conversation he wasn't able to anymore and then he wasn't here anymore and uh, so I'd love to also, if I had the chance, I'd love to have the chance also today, you know, to talk to him, like as, you know, who I am today, I think it would be, that would be a very powerful conversation as well. Those are very nice answers. Um, what What's the like worst advice you've ever received or of the worst advices you've received? That's an interesting question. Something that's popping into my head now. I remember when I was a lawyer, so I was, uh, whatever, I worked in this firm and there was, a, there was a senior person in the firm who was a substantial Talmud Chacham. He was a very accomplished person. And I, you know, I, when I was young in the firm, I would go seek out advice from the elders in the firm who were from, who had been through it, how they got to where they were going. And I remember telling him one day, like, you know, I really, I'm sure I've got a lot of, a lot of other bad advice, but this is what popped into my head right now. <laughs> but he was like saying like, uh, I would tell him I want to go into Rabbanus and he was like, he was like, he was like, he just, he was just kind of like, he was like, you can't be in Rabbanus. Like he was like, what he was like, what are you going to, he was like, what are you going to do? Like in Rabbanus, like, and he started like rattling off, like huge Gedol Yisrael. Like this guy is a Rav and this guy's a Rav. Like you're not on their Madriga. And I wasn't on their Madriga. I mean, granted, but it was like, it was so dismissive. And okay, this guy, whatever, it's not, you know, it's not, I'm not, you know, it wasn't like going to him for like major eights, uh, but it's like, you know, I think people have to, I think people have to build people up. I think people have to see the potential. They have to understand there are all different types of kihilas. There's all different types of, of people that can use chizuk, different types of chizuk, you know, different, different strokes for different folks. Like, you know, maybe you're not going to resonate with it. Maybe you're, okay, you're not going to, I'm not going to be a Rav in, in Lakewood. That's not my thing. You know what I'm saying? But maybe I can be an effective Rav in the five towns, you know, like, like, or in the West side, like have a gestalt that like, you know, there's not one T puss of what something is and don't tell, don't ever tell somebody they can't be something. Like, it's, it's like, you know, I'm not saying it's never, maybe, you know, person's hurting themselves, you know, by, by pursuing something that's really not, uh, you know, not much in for them, but the person has kochos, the person has abilities. So maybe they don't fit exactly into what you like, what your perception is. But I just, I, there's certain things that just sit with you, you know, I can't explain it. Like, you know, certain people just like, there's so many, many great people in my life who have been so inspiring and so big and have encouraged, but there are sometimes there are smaller people along the way that try to discourage or try to like knock you down and that that can be very uh deflating and i try very hard uh not to be that type of person like not to be that person when i when people come my way who need chizik or need advice or need guidance i try very hard to try to uplift and see the positive and try to explain to them where i think they can use their kochos to contribute and not to tell somebody they can't they can't do something well rabbi david m Cohn. It was great getting to know you more. And, and everyone could pick up your book. We're almost there. Living with patience, perseverance, and purpose. And you're you're in the middle of another book, right? Bez Hashem. I am I'm 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 optimistic about I hope to write Chalik Bays of that, which is uh, it's gonna be called We're We're Still Here. Not we're almost there, but we're still here. Could you include the word persistency in the, so, in the we're use, <laughs> so so the plan is to use three P words at the bottom. Like, persistency has to be one of them. So that's living with patience, perseverance, and purpose. This one is gonna be we're still here living with three P's. I don't want to give them away okay. right now. There's there's about six or seven or eight other P's. Persistency, I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, we'll think about it. We'll nice. think about it. But uh, yeah, there's a lot to, I think there's a lot to say in the current uh, environment. And uh, the feedback has been very good. This book came out about four years ago. So there's been a lot of good feedback on it, you know, but kind of like you got to be present. You got to be, you got to be moving forward. You can't be living off one book for your whole, uh, for the rest right. of your and life. If people, so, and people can listen to your podcast, right. uh, the Jewish. Yeah, we call it the JPP, the Jewish Philanthropy Podcast. You can just, you can find it. If you go to my website, rabbidovidemcohen.com, you can, you can find the link there. I will definitely be listening. 
Okay. Thank, thank you. you, Rabbi David M. Cohen. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate it. I think that episode had a, a bunch. It was fun. Yeah, it was. It a was uh, emotional, mm-hmm. entertaining, intuitive. Intuitive. It's a great word, Yaakov. It was intuitive. And it was uh, a doozy of an guys, episode. make sure to go check out his book or David M. Cohen's book and go on probably Amazon or davidmcohen.com. Is that his website? I'm not sure, honestly. But if you Google his name, I'm sure his website will come up. I think yeah. it's rabbi davidmcohen.com. Maybe. Or honestly, I'm really sorry, rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> he's like listening. He's like, it's, what? It's, it's something like that. It's yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's all over online. I see. I mean, he's a very short presence. Yeah. We, we, I mean, the way we, we structure this uh, podcast, we do go after a lot of guests and we do have a lot of names that are suggested to us. And um, Rabbi Cohn was suggested by actually a friend of mine, as he mentioned. And I thought it was really cool that he just dropped off his book. Yeah, us. it was, it was really. That's the way to get things done. It's the way to get his, things uh, persistence. done. Um, so, guys, for and girls, we're the, at the last week for the done contest where you leave a What's review. What's a done contest? You leave a review on Apple Podcasts and hopefully five stars, please. Yeah. And you say something, just one thing about what you love about it, and then you send the email to meaningfulpeoplepodcast at gmail dot com. And you say, done, I just did it. And we're going to choose five winners to that's, get a free Meaningful Minute book. That sounds exciting. And, and I've, you. you know, I've been seeing a few emails come in this week of people who are actually doing it. Yeah, and we got a, a bunch. A lot of reviews, which, which is why we're the number one podcast. Yeah, and we, 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 we battle between others, but it's, it's a fun battle. And um, Well, according to some, the battle is the win. No? Who's uh, Tyra, you know? Yeah. The, ba- the battle is the win. Nah, when he's making up Kfira. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> when you battle, that's that's victory. When you're battling, toiling, that right? Is. You guys know what I mean. I think you should make that into a meaningful minute. Biter. So uh, thanks again for listening. Check out our other podcasts. If you're listening to this, you could listen to this episode. And if you're watching on YouTube, you could listen. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Yeah. So guys, everyone remember to do one chasa today. Also, guys, we got a really exciting and interesting episode coming at your way right. next week. Yeah. Yaku was supposed to say it, but he I totally totally forgot, slipped his yeah. mind. So I'll just tell you, stay tuned, follow us on Instagram, and maybe you'll see some sneak peeks. Yeah.